Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 13. With my guest today, well, there is no guest today. This is one of those sit back and watch me work kind of episodes. What we're going to do today is we're going to winsomely and hopefully amusedly uh, explore the serious impact of serious topics like uh, bitterness, unforgiveness, and the focusing of such emotions on the historical direction of a nation state via the blinkered yet indomitable will of a mighty leader. I'm going to layer today and link together ideas, uh, and we're going to break this video up into sections to make it a little bit easier to, uh, to contemplate and to digest. I'm going to be reading revolutionary language, using that as a guiding railroad track with way stations through other writers who have clearly identified this revolutionary impulse and courageously documented it through the long and bloody history of the 20th century. We're going to be talking about the totalitarian impulse of the blindly willful. So settle in and we're going to be doing a long sermon today. Let's begin from Pravda, number 17, published on January 20th, 1929. And I quote, Bourgeois authors have been using up reams of paper, praising competition, private enterprise, and all the other magnificent virtues and blessings of the capitalists and the capitalist system. Socialists have been accused of refusing to understand the importance of these virtues and of ignoring quote-unquote human nature. As a matter of fact, however, capitalism long ago replaced small independent commodity production under which competition could develop enterprise, energy, and bold initiative to any considerable extent by large, very large-scale factory production, joint stock companies, syndicates, and other monopolies. Under such capitalism, competition means the incredibly brutal suppression of the enterprise, energy and bold initiative of the mass of the population, of its overwhelmingly majority of 99 out of every 100 toilers. It also means that competition is replaced by financial fraud, nepotism, servility on the upper rungs of the social ladder. Far from extinguishing competition, socialism, on the contrary, for the first time creates the opportunity for employing it on a really wide and on a really mass scale for actually drawing the majority of working people into a field of labor in which they can display their abilities, develop the capacities, and reveal those talents so abundant among people whom capitalism crushed, suppressed, and strangled in thousands and millions. Now that a socialist government is in power, our task is to organize the competition. The rich and the rogues are two sides of the same coin. They are the two principal categories of parasites which capitalism fostered. They are the principal enemies 
of socialism. These enemies must be placed under the special surveillance of the entire people. They must be ruthlessly punished for the slightest violation of the laws and regulations of a socialist society. Any display of weakness, hesitation, or sentimentality in this respect would be an immense crime against socialism. In order to render these parasites harmless to a socialist society, we must organize the accounting and the control of the amount of work done and of production and distribution by the entire people, by millions and millions of workers and peasants participating voluntarily, energetically, and with revolutionary enthusiasm. And in order to organize the accounting and control, which is fully within the ability of every honest, intelligent, and efficient worker and peasant, we must rouse their organizing talent, the talent that is to be found in their midst. We must rouse among them and organize on a national scale competition in the sphere of organizational achievement. The workers and peasants must be brought to see clearly the difference between the necessary advice of an educated man and the necessary control by the common quote unquote worker and peasant of the slovenliness that is so usual among the quote unquote educated. Well, I certainly hope that my level of revolutionary enthusiasm will be evident today as we open with the words of a man whose totalizing vision of how to reorder society emanated not from the depths of Western Europe or even from South America, where you may have anticipated it might have come from, but instead directly from the banks of the Volga River. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, or as he's more commonly known these days, V.I. Lenin, was born in Streliskaya, Ulitska, Simberska, now Ulyanovskova, on 22nd of April, 1870, and he was the third of eight children. Among his siblings, Lenin was closest to his sister Olga, whom he often bossed around. He had an extremely competitive nature and could be destructive, but in his early years he usually was comfortable with admitting his misbehavior. While living a relatively uneventful middle-class Russian childhood, the first domino fell in a line of dominoes that would lead to a species of unforgiving and unforgettable bitterness for which an entire nation-state would later bloodily pay. In late January of 1886, when Lenin was 15, his father, born to a family of former serfs with unclear ethnicity, a monarchist, a liberal conservative, and a supporter of the reforms of Tsar Alexander II, tragically died of a brain hemorrhage. Subsequently, Lenin's behavior became erratic and confrontational. And in a moment that surely must have stunned his wealthy, half-Jewish, half-Lutheran, but all-bourgeois mother, Maria, he renounced his belief in God. At the time, Lenin's oldest brother, Alexander, whom he affectionately knew as Sasha, was studying at St. Petersburg University. Involved in political agitation against the absolute monarchy of the reactionary Tsar Alexander III, because that's what happens when monarchs replace one another. A new one has to put his stamp all over the place in all kinds of ways. Alexander studied the writings of banned leftists and organized anti-government protests. Because, of course, that's what your older brother does after the speed limiter presence of the household patriarchy passes on into eternity. Alexander did all the kinds of things that the younger Lenin admired. He enjoyed sit-ins. He spoke eloquently for long hours in tea rooms about radical leftist ideas. He bathed in patchouli oil by the bucketful and, of course, grew his hair out. Eventually, as all young radicals do, Alexander joined a revolutionary cell uh, bent on assassinating the Tsar and was selected to construct a bomb. 
because when circumstances offer you a choice that impacts the direction of world history, circumstances really, really want to make sure that you don't miss the target. Before the attack could take place, however, the conspirators were arrested and tried because there's always sellouts in a truly revolutionary cell. And because they were dealing with the Russian czarist police and military, not some mealy mouth left wing prosecutor in Minneapolis who just mouths the words of justice but doesn't have the minerals to back them up, Alexander was executed in May by, of course, hanging. This event caused his younger brother, Lenin, to spiral psychologically, spiritually, and emotionally. But interestingly enough, just like all true revolutionaries, not educationally or materially, right? He wasn't going to give up his wealth quite just yet. And he got into all kinds of behaviors, like going to university, uh, joining the Zemelich Saishov, uh, getting on watch lists for reading books with titles like uh, What is to be Done and Das Kapital. Apparently, at that point in his time, Dostoevsky was a little bit too mild for him. According to biographer Louis Fisher, writing in 1964, and I want to read a long quote from this in case you're watching, Lenin's collected writings reveal in detail, or listening as you may be doing, Lenin's collected writings reveal in detail a man of iron will, self-enslaving, self-discipline, scorn for opponents and obstacles, the cold determination of a zealot the drive of a fanatic, and the ability to convince or browbeat weaker persons by his singleness of purpose, imposing intensity, impersonal approach, personal sacrifice, political astuteness, and complete conviction of the possession of absolute truth. His entire life became the history of the Bolshevik movement. Lenin was deeply intolerant of opposition and often dismissed outright opinions that differed from his own. He exhibited a propensity for mockery, ridicule, and ad hominem attacks, because that's what you do if you're a Bolshevik revolutionary. And he ignored facts that did not suit his argument, abhorred compromise, and very rarely admitted to his errors. He refused to change his positions or his opinions until he rejected them completely, after which he would treat the new view as if it was just as unchangeable as the old view. Lenin endorsed the violent actions of others and exhibited no remorse for those killed uh, in the revolutionary cause. Many, many years later, after the patchouli and the long hair had hardened into a balding pate and more respectable clothes, he was speaking at the All-Russian Central Executive Committee of the Soviets. And, uh, well, you know, this was a place where political radicalization had long hardened into the bureaucratic fervor that all revolutionaries secretly crave. Lenin declared that, quote, the state is an institution built up for the sake of exercising violence. Previously, this violence was exercised by a handful of money bags over the entire people. Now, we want to organize it, organize violence in the interests of the people. Now, just to prove that it wasn't all about organizing state violence against parasites, walking out the bitterness and unforgiveness he had toward the world he thought robbed him of happiness and overweening pride and arrogance, Lenin the man proved to be for the remainder of the 20th century, a template for how the great professional totalitarians should behave in his personal dealings as well. Aped by the many tyrants who were to follow in his very long wake, Lenin was concerned with physical fitness. Uh, he was fonder of pets than people. 
He lived a Spartan lifestyle, and he disliked creativity in the arts. As a matter of fact, much later from now, we'll give you a quote from there about music after he had been forced to go to an opera. Now, he may have been a totalitarian, and he may have been willing to kill your wife and my wife and the wives of anybody else who he would need to kill in order to get his revolutionary his revolution started or to just continue to see it go. But in his own life, he was remarkably conservative in his marriage, and he had almost no lifelong friends. Differently than all who followed him, however, throughout the bloody last century, Lenin believed fervently, almost religiously, I would say, in the power of his ideas and the force of will required to make other people bend to their power. He disliked the cult of personality that grew up around him, uh, that all of his acolytes and repressive followers would adopt as fait accompli during the time of rule and during their time of rule, all the way from Stalin and Ho Chi Minh to Fidel Castro and Kim Il Sung. They all, to a man, whether they admitted it or not, worshipped at the altar of Lenin. He was the ultimate totalitarian idea. Speaking of worshippers, in January of 1923, Lenin wrote this cautionary note regarding the disciple who would eventually replace him at the top of the state apparatus he built for the sake of exercising violence against all of the parasites and the rogues and the rich. A state apparatus built for little else than grinding human bodies and human potential down into meat. And I quote directly from the man himself, Stalin is too crude. And this defect, which is entirely acceptable in our milieu and in relationships among us as communists, becomes unacceptable in the position of general secretary. I therefore propose to comrades that they should devise a means of removing him from this job and should appoint to this job someone else who is distinguished from comrade Stalin in all other respects only by the slightly superior aspect that he should be more tolerant, more polite, and more attentive towards comrades, less capricious, etc., etc. Close quote. Hmm. Stalin, Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro, Kim Il Sung, Chairman Mao, Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi. The difference between all of them and Stalin and the difference between Stalin and Lenin, well, all of them to a man were tyrants. But Lenin, Lenin was a totalitarian. And as I said before, he was a totalitarian ideal. And an ideal no matter how many different ways you want to cut it at the top of a hierarchy, fundamentally judges you.
And now for something a little bit different, we're going to take a little bit of a turn after looking at Lenin. We're going to look at a, at a contemporary, I guess, an older contemporary of Lenin. We're going to read a selection from something a little bit further down the trough from Anton Chekhov's Champagne, a wayfarer's story. In the year in which my story begins, I had a job at a little station in one of our southwestern railways. Whether I had a gay or a dull life at the station, you can judge from the fact that for 15 miles round, there was not one human habitation, not one woman, not one decent tavern. And in those days, I was young, strong, hot-headed, giddy, and foolish. The only distraction I could possibly find was in the windows of the passenger trains and in the vile vodka which the Jews drugged with thorn apple. Sometimes I would, sometimes there would be a glimpse of a woman's head at a carriage window and one would stand like a statue without breathing and stare at it until the train turned into an almost invisible speck. Or one would drink all one could of the loathsome vodka to one was stupefied and did not feel the passing of the long hours and days. Upon me, a native of the north, the steppe produced the effect of a deserted Tartar cemetery. In the summer, the steppe, with its solemn calm, the monotonous chur of the grasshoppers, the transparent moonlight from which one could not hide, reduced me to listless melancholy. And in the winter, the irreproachable whiteness of the steppe, its cold distance, long nights, and howling wolves oppressed me like a heavy nightmare. There were several people living at the station. My wife and I, a deaf and scrofulous telegraph clerk, and three watchmen. My assistant, a young man who was in consumption, used to go for treatment to the town where he stayed for months at a time, leaving his duties to me together with the right pocketing his salary, the right of pocketing his salary. I had no children, no cake would have tempted visitors to come and see me, and I could only visit other officials on the line, and no oftener than once a month. I had already drunk five glasses of drugged vodka and, propping my heavy head on my fist, thought of my overpowering boredom from which there was no escape, while my wife sat beside me and did not take her eyes off of me. She looked at me as no one can look but a woman who has nothing in this world but a handsome husband. She loved me madly, slavishly, and not merely my good looks or my soul, but my sins, my ill humor and boredom, and even my cruelty when, in drunken fury, not knowing how to vent my ill humor, I tormented her with reproaches. That is a selection from Champagne, a Wayfarer's Story by Anton Chekhov. And Chekhov is part of a long line of Russian writers, Russian cultural tastemakers, uh, who came up at the time when Lenin was agitating and preceded him by just uh, either a generation or a half a generation. Of course, the most famous of these Russian writers was uh, the gentleman Dost Fyodor Dostoevsky. And, you know, from Crime and Punishment to the Brothers Karmazov, uh, from, you know, War and Peace and Anna Karenina to the selection that we just read there. Russian writing, society, and culture always seems to be driven by an obsession with answering this question. Am I my brother's keeper? A question asked, ironically enough, um, by Cain after attempting to cover up with little success, the murder of his brother, his own ideal. Chekhov's short story, Champagne, a Wayfarer's Story, a story of bitterness, resentment, pride, and arrogance, really focuses on that relationship between a wife, a husband, and the love of a man for his young aunt. 
It is in the small things. And the Russian writer a century later, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, would make this point brilliantly in the Gulag Archipelago. It is in the small things that we find the seeds sown for the destruction of the nation state, for the ability of a man like Lenin, or maybe an ideal like Lenin, to actually have the ground to be fertilized in and the soil to grow. Back to Chekhov's Champagne, a wayfarer's story for just a moment. My wife met me at the doorway. Her eyes were laughing gaily and her whole face was beaming with good humor. There's news for you, she whispered. Make haste, go to your room, and put on your new coat. We have a visitor. What visitor? Aunt Natalia Petronova has just come by train. What Natalia Petronova? The wife of my uncle, Simon Fyodorovich. You don't know her. She is very nice. Good woman. Probably, I frowned, for my wife looked grave and whispered rapidly. Of course it is queer having her come, but don't be cross, Nikolai, and don't be hard on her. She is unhappy. You know, Uncle Seymour Fyodorovich really is ill-natured and tyrannical. It is difficult to live with him. She says she will only stay three days with us, only till she gets a letter from her brother. My wife whispered a great deal more nonsense to me about her despotic uncle, about the weakness of mankind in general, and of young wives in particular, about its being our duty to give shelter to all, even great sinners, and so on. Unable to make head or tail of it, I put on my new coat and went to make an acquaintance with my aunt. Chekhov's light touch and Dostoevsky's quote-unquote unhappy warrior, right? Uh, their demeanor and their writing and artistic demeanor worked out the tyrannical nature of small actions, small decisions, and small engagements and really worked out or began at least the, began at least the thinking of working out how those actions, decisions, and engagements scale up and impact uh, neighbors, uh, community, and at a higher level, the nation state itself. So if every human being, and this is an idea that Dostoevsky had, is responsible for him or herself and for pursuing forgiveness and reconciliation at the smallest level first, what happens when a person is consumed by bitterness? For instance, the bitterness that comes from everyday slights or betrayals or even cosmic slights like the death of a parent or the destruction of a society or a culture for mere existing. And then that person seeks to create through their own action or inaction a hell on earth. From Encyclopedia Britannica, Yitzhak Zuckerman, uh, a hero of Jewish resistance to the Nazis in World War II and one of the few survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, 
Zuckerman was active in a federation of young Zionist organizers, Heihalutz, an early favored armed resistance to the Nazi depredation against the Jews. He was quick to interpret the first mass execution of Jews as the beginning of a systematic program of annihilation. Perceiving the full scope of Nazi plans and realizing that they had nothing left to lose, Zuckerman and resistance leaders such as Abba Kovner and Mordecai and Namowitz found the determination to resist and to risk their lives. In March 1942, Zuckerman presented Heihalutz at a meeting of Zionist groups and urged the creation and arming of a defense organization. Others feared that resistance would provoke the Nazis to greater violence, but on July 28th, soon after the first daily train load of 5,000 Jews left the Warsaw Ghetto to be gassed at Treblinka, Jewish leaders accepted Zuckerman's view and created the Jewish Fighting Organization under the leadership of Ina Weitz. Zuckerman became one of his three co-commanders and also helped lead a political affiliate founded at the same time, the Jewish National Committee. With numerous contacts in the underground resistance groups on the Irian side, i.e. outside the ghetto, Zuckerman negotiated the gifts and black market purchases of the pistols, grenades, and few rifles that the Jewish Fighting Organization obtained. He smuggled these along with messages into the ghetto through the Warsaw sewers. When the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising broke out, Zuckerman was outside the ghetto and did what he could to spread the word of the plight of the ghetto's remaining Jews to the Polish underground and to the Poles and Jews abroad. He also smuggled in to the Jewish fighting organization any additional guns and grenades that could be found. After 20 days of battle, Einelweitz and his companions died when the Nazis overcame their command bunker and Zuckerman returned to the ghetto to take charge. Before the end of the 28-day battle, he led some 75 fighters, including his future wife, Zivia Lubetkin, through the sewers and into the underground havens on the Iranian side. Zuckerman continued to lead a Jewish band of guerrillas in the Polish underground and to alert Jewish leaders elsewhere to the situation of Jews inside of Nazi Europe. At war's end, he organized underground transportation for Jewish refugees from Europe to Palestine, where he and Zivia settled in 1947. They, with others, were the founders of the kibbutz, um, the Ghetto Fighters, north of Haifa, where a memorial museum, Ghetto Fighters House, was established. Zuckerman and his wife were prosecution witnesses in the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann, Zuckerman was the author of A Surplus of Memory. Zuckerman was recognized as a hero for his efforts, but his heroism gave him little comfort. He began drinking after the war, and he suffered mental anguish. He told one interviewer, and I quote, If you could lick my heart, it would poison you. If you could lick my heart, it would poison you. How do we resist totalitarian behavior? How do we resist tyrannical behavior? How do we do that as individuals caught up in the milieu of the state? Whether that state is designed by a leftist or a rightist really matters not. How do we resist totalitarianism? How do we resist the totalitarian impulse? How do we recognize that it is coming? And how do we lead others effectively to deal with it as well? And how do we avoid the poison of bitterness in our own hearts? The same poison, by the way, that causes people to build a state that crushes the heart in the first place. From the comfort of our headphones, it's easy to talk in abstract terms, as I'm doing right now, about bitterness and ask abstract questions about bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, and hatred. It's, it's very easy. I'll admit, it's harder when the decision to resist must actually be taken up 
while and while Yitzhak and Lenin would <laughs> surely, for sure, be on opposite sides of the question here, their reasoning toward action, the decision to resist either the czarist state and build a new regime or the Nazi state and build a, well, resisting regime, they both wind up in the same place. It's not lost on me that Yitzhak's book was titled A Surplus of Memory. I, uh, I, I don't miss the irony there. However, never forgetting doesn't mean never forgiving. And in the end, a leader may need to be a wolf to catch a wolf, but it's much harder to maintain the posture of a sheepdog. Hell from the political right or hell from the political left is all the same hell. And we need people, we need leaders who can show us how to come out on the other side of hell with a spirit of rebellion and a heart of forgiveness. Speaking of hell, let's talk about your enemies, right? Because your enemies will seek to, well, manipulate you, right? If you have a heart that is unforgiving, if you have a heart that is so heavy with poison that if I licked it, it would poison me, and it's slowly killing you, and the only thing that you can do, the only way you can think to deal with it is to turn on the very people who might save you, your enemies, the people who are bent on your destruction. Well, they'll pull a Napoleon. They'll get the heck out of your way and let you destroy yourself. And as a matter of fact, they might go a little bit further. They might help you destroy yourself. Whether we think about the Wayfarer being lured into destruction by circumstance, or whether we think about Yitzhak being forced into a choice he may have never wanted to make, or we think about Lenin, who seems to have greedily pursued the ideal out of a sense of revenge, they all had enemies. They all had people who were observing them from the outside and wondering, how can I use this to benefit me and my end? How can I use this person's anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, sense of betrayal, mistrust? How can I come up on their blind side and get a hold of them? When you think about Lenin, the event the geopolitical event that surrounds him was, of course, World War I. And during the course of World War I, Lenin had actually been kicked out of Russia. Actually, before World War I, he'd been kicked out of Russia. The czarists uh, were unhappy with his revolutionary fervor, and they thought the best way to deal with him was to get him to leave. And so Lenin began a tour. And he went on a tour of Europe for many, many years, and he stayed away from Russia. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't write. He, he did. It doesn't mean he didn't make speeches. He did. It doesn't mean he didn't agitate for political change and political revolution all the way to the point of a bullet going into a body. 
he did, but it just means he didn't actually, and he wasn't actually either going home or at home to pull the trigger directly. Now, there are people watching this, right? Because it doesn't take much to raise the attention of people in Western Europe, and it really doesn't take much to capture the attention of the Germans at that time. We forget about it now because we live in the light of the Cold War where Germany uh, has been reduced to a shadow of its once former glory. But in the middle 19th century and well into the middle 20th century, Germany was the boogeyman of Europe. Germany was the... Uh, <laughs> Germany was the Russia of its day. It was the, it was the, uh, well, it was the ghost that was in your closet. It was the Scooby-Doo villain that was revealed to be underneath everything. From the Kaiser to Hitler, everybody in Europe who was in politics and everybody in Europe who was in culture and everybody who in Europe was watching history watched the Germans very closely. With that being said, the Germans watched everybody else very closely as well. And one of the guys they really kept an eye on was this fellow, Lenin. Because at the end of the day, someone who's that bitter can probably be used, probably be leveraged, probably be thrown like a Molotov cocktail into a place to cause chaos. To quote from What If Number Two, a great book, by the way, you might want to pick it up, a collection of essays about counterfactual history written by historians, journalists, and others. Uh, the essay on the Finland station is an interesting counterfactual. What if there had been no Finland station? What if the Germans hadn't made it possible for Lenin to get back into Russia? What if the Germans had been less blinkered in their pursuit of destroying the dragon that only they could see, which was the Russian dragon? And I quote from No Finland Station, A Russian Revolution Without Lenin by George Pfeiffer. World War II's devastation and the Cold War's rending would remind successive generations of suffering Germans that subversion, like poison gas, tends to spread beyond its intended limits. In the late winter of 1916 to 1917, secret exchanges between Wilhelm Strauss, its ambassadors in Bern, and elsewhere, and the general staff confirmed as one put it, that, quote, we must now definitely try to create the utmost chaos in Russia. Our support of the extreme Russian elements is preferable because that way the work is done more thoroughly. According to all forecasts, we count on the disintegration being so far advanced in three months or so that our military intervention will guarantee the collapse of Russian power. An official deal was therefore struck with St. Petersburg to exchange German nationals interned in Russia for Marxist exiles in Switzerland, who were, give, who were to give the permission and means for transit. And one of those Russian exiles was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. Your enemies will manipulate you if you are a leader, or at least they will seek to manipulate you to accomplish their own ends particularly if you're willfully blind, arrogant, and blinkered by your own trauma. And when those enemies are Germans, if you're a disaffected Russian dissident who's been kicked out of your country for more than just being a scamp who wanted people to die, the manipulation reaches cosmic levels. The Germans should have never allowed Lenin's train to leave Finland Station. But how could they have known? By the way, just an interesting historical fact, in late September 1916, when all these secret exchanges were going on and on, when all this paper was flying back and forth, um, and when everything was getting real hot and heavy between the Germans and the Russians, at the Somme, a Bavarian army corporal named Adolf Hitler was dispatched with his unit to a place 
Hitler himself described later on in less than glowing terms as, quote, a place more like hell than war. Turns out that history, history has an opinion. And history, well, history will win on its opinion of your leadership in the end. Back to From How to Organize the Competition by Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. The great change from working under compulsion to working for oneself to labor planned and organized on a gigantic national and even to a certain extent international world scale also requires, in addition to quote-unquote military measures for the suppression of the exploiter's resistance, Tremendous organizational organizing effort on the part of the proletariat and the poor peasants. The organizational task is interwoven to form a single whole with the task of ruthlessly suppressing by military methods yesterday's slave owners, capitalists, and their packs of lackeys, the bourgeois intellectual gentlemen. Yesterday's slave owners and their intellectual stooges say and think, we have always been organizers and chiefs, we have commanded and we want to continue to do so. We shall refuse to obey the common people, the workers and peasants. We shall not submit to them. We shall convert knowledge into a weapon for the defense of the privileges of the money bags and of the rule of capital over the people. That is what the bourgeois and the bourgeois intellectuals say, think and do. From the point of view of self-interest, their behavior is comprehensible. The hangers-on and spongers on the feudal landowners, the priests, the scribes, the bureaucrats, as Gogol depicted them, and the intellectuals who hated Belinsky also found it, quote-unquote, hard to part with serfdom. But the cause of the exploiters and of their intellectual menials is hopeless. The workers and peasants are beginning to break down their resistance. Unfortunately, not yet firmly, resolutely, and ruthlessly enough, and break it down, they will. The accounting and control essential for the transition to socialism can be exercised only by the people. Only the voluntary and conscientious cooperation of the mass of the workers and peasants in accounting and controlling the rich, the rogues, the idlers, and the rowdies, a cooperation marked by revolutionary enthusiasm, can conquer these survivals of a cursed capitalist society, these dregs of humanity, these hopelessly decayed and atrophied limbs, this contagion, this plague, this ulcer that socialism has inherited from capitalism. What do you get from that? Well, you get from that that Lenin would say, your point of view is understandable, but I don't care. He's calling you an ulcer. He's calling you a contagion. He's calling you a plague. And he's marshalling the forces of the state to stamp out this plague because he has set himself up as an ideal. He set himself up at the top of the hierarchy. He has set himself up in control 
yes, on the backs of bloody revolution, yes, on the backs of hundreds of thousands of and soon to be millions of dead people, but he has set himself up. So what is the moral choice here? Well, tragically for you all, moral choice and the ability to influence moral choice don't really matter to Lenin. Quoting again from George Pfeiffer's essay in What If Two, moral choice, or immoral as the case may be, was resolved by force of character, his. He was never one to mix personal feelings with impersonal fact. And I quote, I can't listen to music too often, he once commented mirthlessly after he had been forced to sit through a concert. It makes me want to say kind, stupid things and pat the heads of people. But now you have to beat them on the head, beat them without mercy. The leader for whom moral choice is resolved by force of character has either a character flaw or judgment flaw, or both flaws. And we would do well to remove those leaders from the handles, the machinations, and the levers of state power, not give them more ability to expand into more spaces. Lenin would have loved, in our current day, by the way, Lenin would have loved the social media geniuses of Silicon Valley because, um, and he would have loved them, by the way, almost as much as the kid in the TikTok video that you like who has a hammer and sickle flag in his background and doesn't know what it means. He would have loved those folks because, quite frankly... They are grasped, they are powered, they are driven by a totalitarian ideal. Now, they may not be putting folks in gulags and they may not be uh, suppressing individuals away. They may not be allowing things on their platform that critique the very capitalism that gave them money away. They may not be holding up their fists in communistic fervor saying workers of the world oh wait we're not political on this podcast it's about leadership but you can't look at a leader without len like lenin without being political and i would be remiss to not at the very minimum bring up the point that when a leader particularly a political leader, is strutting about the stage, expressing an ideal and demonstrating it, an ideal driven by a heart of bitterness and anger, a heart driven by disgust of humanity and by a desire for the power to engage 
in pursuing a particular goal. When we see that leader strut about, when we read the words that they write, when we watch the YouTube videos that they make, we cannot be seduced. We should not be seduced. We dare not be seduced out of our reasoning mind or out of our gut sense that something is wrong into going down a road of totalitarianism because these days that road is paved not at a national level but at a global level and when we have leaders in the corporate world the business world the medium-sized enterprise world shaking hands with the beast and I use that term on purpose of global governance in the vain glorious hope that they will be eaten last by the beast of a global entity who on the one hand says that they seek to organize the proletariat energy in the service of making sure with military means of course better outcomes and then on the other hand says they're organizing all of it for our own good because of course just like Lenin before them they know what is for my and your and everybody else who's listening to this is own good well we should judge those people harshly we should go and stop them as much as we possibly can and we should raise our voices in opposition because otherwise we might wind up in the position of Yitzhak where the bitterness flows back downhill to our own hearts. Quoting from Klaus Schwab and the World Bank regarding ESG and the Great Reset. And I quote directly from their own words to you. To achieve a better outcome, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies, from education to social contracts and working conditions. Every country, from the United States to China, must participate in every industry, from oil and gas to tech, must be transformed. In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. Incremental measures and ad hoc fixes will not suffice to prevent this scenario. We must build entirely new foundations for our economic and social systems. The level of cooperation and ambition this implies is unprecedented, but it is not somehow or not some impossible dream. In fact, one silver lining of the pandemic is that it has shown how quickly we can make radical changes to our lifestyles. Almost instantly, the crisis forced businesses and individuals to abandon practices long claimed to be essential, from frequent air travel to working in an office. Likewise, populations have overwhelmingly shown a willingness to make sacrifices for the sake of health care and other essential workers and vulnerable populations, such as the elderly. And many companies have stepped up to support their workers, customers, and local communities and a shift toward the kind of stakeholder capitalism to which they had previously paid lip service. Clearly, the will to build a better society does exist. We must use it to secure the great reset that we so badly need. That will require stronger and more effective governments. <laughs> Though this does not imply an ideological push for bigger ones and it will demand private sector engagement every step of the way. Back to Lenin for just a moment. Advice and instruction, however, is one thing, and the organization of practical accounting and control is another. Very often the intellectuals give excellent advice and instruction, but they prove to be ridiculously, absurdly shameful and unhandy and incapable of carrying out this advice and instruction of exercising practical control over the translation of words into deeds. In this very respect, it is utterly impossible to dispense with the help and the leading role of the practical organizers from among, quote unquote, the people, from among the factory workers and working peasants. It is not the gods who make pots. This is the truth that the workers and peasants should get well drilled into their minds. 
They must understand that the whole thing now is practical work, that the historical moment has arrived when theory is being transformed into practice, vitalized by practice, corrected by practice, tested by practice. When the words of Marx, and I quote, every step of real movement is more important than a dozen programs, unquote, become particularly true, every step in really curbing, in practice, restricting, fully registering the rich and the rogues and keeping them under control is worth more than a dozen excellent arguments about socialism. For theory, my friend, is gray, but green is the eternal tree of life. By the way, green is also the environmental movement. Welcome to 2030. I own nothing. I have no privacy and life has never been better. Yeah, okay. Sure. It turns out that a little over 100 years after Lenin moseyed on back home in a sealed train, turns out we haven't learned anything in the West, I guess, or globally. Sure. We're a long way from transporting weapons to the revolutionary front on horse-drawn wagons. But Klaus Schwab's impulse is the same as Lenin's. And it is the impulse to control another human being. In essence, to create a better world for their own good. And that impulse hasn't gone anywhere. Matter of fact, I'll go back even further. This goes back to Rousseau and David Hume. This goes back to the French revolutionaries and the French intellectuals that underlie Nietzsche and Marx, Lenin and Engels. And all the way down now in a drip of water, of bitterness, arrogance, resentment and pride, to Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum, and of course, the Great Reset. Are we all just going to kind of sit around and let totalitarianism just have its day? Are we really so blinkered in our TikTok videos with our hammer and sickle flags in the background that we can't see that 100 million dead people can easily become 200 million or 300 million? How many eggs do you have to break to build a better world? How many pots do you have to make? And why does Karl Haus Schwab or Lenin or Mao or any of the rest of them get to be the one that decides that the pots get made? Lenin believed that liberty was merely a mask for bourgeoisie repression of the masses. He didn't believe in liberty. But the problem now that we have in the year of our Lord 2022 is that the masses now have social media and we have built panopticons because of our own overweening self-interest, selfishness, selfish desire because of our own need to work impulses out. We have built panopticons of our own making that Lenin could only have dreamed of. And thoughts and impulses can be monitored now all the way down to the keystroke. Lulled by fake promises of security and safety, Lenin's proletariat, or what would have formerly been Lenin's proletariat, are now turned into the czar's serfs, Schwab's serfs. And all along with the serfs playing along, thinking that they're playing the game, beating out blockchains of their own digital gulags that will stretch into an archipelago across the internet itself. Totalitarianism with a social media crust is still a crap pie underneath, and you need to remember that. And words, the clear definition of terms, defining totalitarianism and accurately identifying what it is and accurately identifying who is saying what and why is the only tool that oppressed people have 
to keep their necks out of the noose, as in the James Franco meme. And if it's your first time here, by the way, welcome. To wrap up from how to organize the competition by Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, thousands of practical forms and methods of accounting and controlling the rich, the rogues, and the idlers must be devised and put into put to a practical test by the communes themselves, by small units in town and country. Variety is a guarantee of effectiveness here, a pledge of success in achieving the single common aim to clean the land of all Russian vermin, of fleas, of rogues, of bugs, the rich, and so forth. In one place, half a score of rich dozen rogues, half a dozen workers who shirk their work in the matter of rowdies, the manner in which many compositors in Petrograd, particularly in the party print shops, uh, shirk their work, will be put in prison. In another place, they will be put to cleaning latrines. In a third place, they will be provided with yellow tickets after they have served their time so that everyone shall keep an eye on them as harmful persons until they reform. In a fourth place, one out of every ten idlers will be shot on the spot. In a fifth place, mixed methods may be adopted, and by probational release, for example, the rich, the bourgeoisie intellectuals, the rogues and rowdies, who are corrigible, will be given an opportunity to reform quickly. The more variety there will be, the better and richer will be our general experience. The more certain and rapid will be the success of socialism, and the easier it will be for practice to devise, for only practice can devise, the best methods and means of struggle. This is a podcast built around the idea that revolutionary times, and I do fundamentally believe that we live in revolutionary times, that in revolutionary times, uh, what matters are the individuals. We've talked a lot about a lot of things today. We've talked a lot about tyranny. Um, I've addressed totalitarianism and the totalitarian impulse. Demonstrated, I think, fairly clearly how Lenin represented that impulse and set the template for everything that we saw uh, over the course of the long, bloody 20th century. And it looks as though he has set the template for what we may see in the 21st century if we don't get our arms around identifying it and rooting it out. The totalitarian impulse, that is, not necessarily in Klaus Schwab's heart although that would be a good beginning, but in our own hearts. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Chekhov, these Russian writers, they understood something fundamental that the Russian people actually got to live out, and now we have it, the examples to read and observe in history from. And this is a podcast that is built on the idea that the great books of the past can teach us, the great writings of the past can teach us something that we don't know about what is happening right now and make us better leaders. 
And at the end of the day, when you are leading your company, when you're leading your small textile company, when you're leading your small tech startup, when you are leading your small bottling company, when you are leading a construction company, when you are leading a furniture making company, whatever the enterprise is that you're leading on, you are at the top of a hierarchy. You are an ideal and you must avoid the totalitarian impulse in your own heart. You must recognize it and you must root it out. You must root out the tendency to engage in tyrannical behavior. You must go deep and understand why you're doing what you're doing and for whose good exactly it is that you're doing it for. There's a lot of talk about collaborative work this and, you know, uh, positive leadership that. There's a lot of talk about charisma and servitude in leadership. There's a lot of talk uh, about uh, what are the best ways we can organize our human resources? And by the way, if you're calling the human beings inside of your organization resources, I think you probably need to change your language and change your focus. This month on the podcast, and this is why I started with Lenin, we are going to look at these hard hard Russian writers and the Russian writers are hard, uh, working my way through crime and punishment right now. And, uh, I've, I read war and peace years ago. Uh, I'll go back and look at that again. And of course, we're going to look at Alexander Solzhenitsyn and a day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. And of course the Gulag archipelago, because we have to look at the work and the writing of the people who came before us so that in these times we don't become seduced by revolution or ground down by this idea that we can't do anything and that somehow we are powerless and that events will merely sweep us along and we'll somehow wind up in 2030 where we'll own nothing and we'll pretend to like it but the human soul, the human spirit will be put out like a light. Nothing is guaranteed as a leader and uh, nothing's guaranteed as a follower. Nothing is guaranteed in this world. You have to work for it. You have to fight for it. You have to indeed advocate for it. And so a word about tyranny and totalitarianism to wrap up. Tyrants tend to fall and tyrannies tend to end and totalitarian, the totalitarian impulse never goes away, but tyranny tyranny itself, the rule of a totalitarian over you, whether that rule is your boss um, or that rule is the leader of a nation state, tyrants fall and tyrannies end when their iniquity, like that of the Amorites in the Old Testament, is judged to be complete. And usually if no one does anything, the judger who decides that the iniquity is complete is the only entity in the universe that moves a leader's heart in his hands like water. In the meantime, in the warm-up rounds, before the main event of the fall, leaders have a responsibility. I would dare say they have a deeper accountability to resist the totalitarian impulse that may lie in their own hearts. And... They need to recognize and root out all of the little amateur tyrants that are in their midst who's in, in whose bitter heart a totalizing impulse might nestle. Otherwise, if we just do what we've been doing, if we skip along unseriously, posting our sickle, hammer and sickle framed TikTok videos, and pretending like it all doesn't matter or like the totalitarian impulse would be a good alternative choice because there's just too much democracy. There's just too much egalitarianism. There's just too much liberty going on out here. And God help us, someone might make a wrong choice and we can't have that. If we continue to skip along unseriously, we will all, every single last one of us within the sound of my voice, we will all wind up rolling bones for who gets the top bunk in an increasingly heavily populated gulag. And if you think I'm being over the top, if you think I'm being crazy, if you think that I am being, well, exaggerative, the Chinese call themselves Leninist capitalists. 
I'll just pause and let that one sink in for a while. There are three heavy lessons that we can learn today as leaders that we can apply individually um, in our own experience and in our own existence. And they are hard lessons that Lenin teaches us through his negative example. And they are hard lessons that Yitzhak taught us through his positive example. Lesson number one. Watch out very closely as a leader for the junior Lenins on your team who manipulate language, who manufacture conflict, and who hide their motives behind words that sound fancy like justice or collaborative or social good, or they use fancy acronyms like ESG to hide what they really want to do. Watch out for them. Lesson number two for leaders, clean out your own heart and role model living that way for others. Yeah, uh, H. Liddell Hart was correct. Prophets may wind up being martyrs and you might be a prophet uh, kicked out of your own company, kicked out of your own team, heck, even kicked out of your own country. But good people, just as Martin Luther King Jr. pointed out, good people need to make hay while the sun shines with as much haste and intention as bad people do. Clean out your own heart, role model good living, and make haste as quickly as the bad people are. And lesson number three, and this one's huge, tell the truth. This means actually saying truthful words. This means examining your speech, examining your heart, but examining your speech First, tell the truth to yourself. Do it with clarity, with candor, and with courage. Maybe do it a little winsomely, of course. Maybe do it a little jokingly. Maybe do it, uh, you know, in a little bit of a way that matches your own, a little bit in a way that matches your own character. But tell the truth to yourself first. But then as a leader, be sure to tell the truth to others particularly during our time where wars and rumors of wars are abound. And we know that the first casualty in war, and heck, the first casualty when there's a rumor of war, is always the truth. This is how we stay on the path. This is how we manage to build a better world without needing a world economic forum without needing a mayor without needing a coercive fascistic corporate state this is how we build a better world starting in the individual things that we can do in our individual lives and working in concentric circles out to impact a much larger community An ideal judges you, so choose your ideal carefully. Who do you want to be judged by? Do you want to be judged by the state? Do you want to be judged by the family? Do you want to be judged by your community? Or do you want to be judged by God? Who is the ideal that you want to be judged by? Choose your ideal carefully. And then, when the Lenins show up, you won't have bitterness in your heart. You might have a spirit of rebellion. You might have a spirit of resistance. But at least you'll be rebellious. And at least you'll be resisting. Not only knowing why you're doing what you're doing. But you'll be able to do it with a light heart. Knowing that your ideal. Is not here on earth. And is not temporal. But is somewhere else. And is eternal. All right. Well, that's it for me.